uh, Ehud has wide ranging interests across finance matter, AMO physics, quantum information. He won numerous awards for his work, most recently, the Times Investigator Award. Um, his recent interests have focused on quantum dynamics and topics ranging from mind body localization to quantum chaos and summarization, and most recently on, on measurement induced entanglement phenomena and measurement induced phenomena in many body systems. So, uh, delighted to have you here with us. Thank you very much, Arika, for the introduction. Uh, I'm very I want to thank John for, for inviting me here and we were sad that we had to go after Cloud Zoom and talk to him at some other point. Um, it's always great to be back here in Stanford. Um, so uh, my title is Measurement Induced Criticality in Many by Brown Sticks. I'm actually going to deviate a little bit from it and tell you also about that some related side story, which is uh, not related either to measurements or is, uh, but it's, uh, it's actually kind of related in an interesting way. Um, a lot of this work was done, and related work was done with uh, many of these people. Um, uh, Sunwon, we started uh, work with uh, Sunwon Choi and Yimo Bao. My uh, Sunwon was an undergraduate postdoc in Berkeley. I'm another fellow now in MIT, and he was a uh, graduate student. Uh, a lot of the talk, uh, a lot of what I'll talk about was done by Zach Hansen and uh, Stan Garrett. Stan Garrett is a newer fellow now in Berkeley, and Zach is a graduate student. Um, <clears throat> so, just for I understand that many people here are uh, experimentalists, um, and that this work that I'll talk about was it's rather theoretical. We didn't talk directly about experimental implementation. However, we, we actually do have kind of now follow-up work that if you want to talk about you know, questions uh, related to experiment, but the motivation is definitely the fact that new experimental systems can diagnose many body systems much, much more in detail and in new kinds of diagnostics than we knew before. And especially I want to focus on the fact that um, uh, you know, it, what you heard, for example, just in this uh, uh, short talk uh, from John Diamond School by um, Danielle, it, it is that um, we're going into the era where people can do mid circuit measurements, which is something that's necessary for uh, quantum computation. And in this kind of case, when, when measurements become part of our dynamics, then measurements is no longer just the diagnostics. We have to understand how measurement impacts the many body state because of quantum collapse. And, and that would be the gist of what I want to talk about here. Um, uh, and, and show that there are actually very interesting collective effects that we didn't know about before because we didn't really treat measurements in, in this way, and not as a diagnostic, but as an active part of, of our quantum system. Um, sorry. So, yeah, uh, again, measurements have a very important and unique role in, in quantum mechanics. As you know, basically from quantum, quantum mechanics 101, uh, one of the two fundamental time evolutions in quantum mechanics are either unitary evolution or wave function collapse due to, uh, due to measurement. So, this is wave function collapse. You're basically projected to the projector on the <laughs> measurement outcome and renormalization of the uh, state. And this kind of quantum collapse can destroy quantum correlations, as for example, in this quantum correlation of a Schrodinger cat, when you measure something in it, it will collapse into a usually dead cat. Uh, or, or if you have um, quantum correlation in a bell pair, by measuring one part of this bell pair, you're collapsing the state into one which no longer has quantum correlation. So you can destroy quantum correlations. This is an active effect of the measurement, the wave function collapse. And it's a non-local effect because you destroy the non-local correlation, you affected the wave function in a non-local way. In fact, you don't 
necessarily always destroy quantum correlations. You can also create quantum correlations that did not exist before the experiment. And a nice example of this is sort of a teleport quantum teleportation protocol where you have three labs, one, two, three, and uh, you have a bell pair between lab one and lab two, and between lab two and lab three, if you make a lo local measurement in lab two, in a bell basis, you can create a large long range entanglement between one in lab one and lab two that did not exist there before. And then you can utilize this entanglement together with classical communication in order to teleport a quantum state. So, so basically, the point is that measurements can have very weird non-local effects on quantum wave function and this uh, and quantum wave function and this effect can be both to destroy quantum correlations or to create new quantum correlations. And now we're all of this really regards very simple wave functions of few particles or even if this cat has many particles it's a very simple state of just dead cat and light cat not many intermediate states of the cat. Um, so um, it's interesting to ask, and that's only been you know, a recent endeavor to understand how this kind of, in, in these kinds of effects uh, of measurement where we understand, try to understand the impact of wave function collapse um, effect um, can play out in a many body wave function. For example, like a many body wave function describing the highly entangled state describing, say, a quantum magnet or a state evolving in a quantum circuit that has lots of entanglement. So probably, the, um, yeah, so in this talk, I'll first give you, but I guess maybe half of you don't, uh, haven't heard about measurement in loose transition, I'll give you a brief introduction on what are measurement in loose transitions that people are excited about recently, why they're very hard to observe, and how do we understand this, these uh, phase transitions in quantum circuit from the point of view of encoding of quantum information in, in these quantum circuits. So this would be the first part of my talk, kind of a brief review. Then, uh, well, and one important part of the review that I want you to take out is why it's really fundamentally extremely hard to see these phase transitions, so hard that there was recently, just maybe two weeks ago, a paper came out and said, there is nothing like measurement in loose transition because it's impossible in fundamentally to see an experiment. I don't agree with you know, the language they use, but it is true that there is some fundamental obstacle to seeing these experiment transitions in experiment that I want to try to import one. Um, Understand, understand well, get you to understand well. And then part two is saying, well, the main obstacle is the fact that we have to do many measurements. And the question is whether we can have a similar kind of transition where we have a similar kind of information, a, a, a phase transition in information flow in the circuit without doing any measurements uh, and, and therefore not having this fundamental obstacle, which I'll call post-selection problem. Uh, and then the third part is, will be another way to kind of try to understand the impact of, uh, of, of measurements in a more simple setting, rather than in a controlled quantum circuit where you, uh, it, um, like in a quantum computer where you can do mid-circuit measurement, I want to ask something that is maybe more experimentally relevant to code atom labs, where you can create a ground state or something close to a ground state. And this ground state could be somewhat entangled or even better, long range entangled like a critical ground state. Then you do a series of measurements on this ground state that do not completely destroy it. So it's like non dimensional measurements, but of course they have a major impact on the measurements and collapsing the wave function. And one can ask, how do the correlations in this ground state change post measurement? And whether the measurements are relevant in the sense that they completely change very long range correlations. The question is whether local measurements can completely change the long range correlations existing in, in this correlated ground state. So, basically, the most uh, basic way to address the question I formulated in, in the beginning, where you have, say, 
two particles you measure one, how do I change the correlations by measuring now instead of two particles that have a many body entangled state described by some kind of critical correlation, I'm measuring it partially and a question how do these correlations change without any dynamics, just immediately after the measure. Any further dynamics? There is just the dynamics of signal measurement. Okay, so before review of uh, measurement reduced transition, one more preliminary step is to understand what's the difference between, because I always encounter people that say, okay, why, why is it really special measurements if nothing but opening the system to an environment? I want to say this is very different in some important respect. So when I have an open system, uh, it, this is the usual way to describe the coherence processes. You have a system coupled to a bat. A bat is a big number of degrees of freedom that you're just not keeping track of, but has degrees of freedom. As the system evolves, it gets more and more entangled with the bat. So even if the system was initially in a pure state, it was, was not entangled with the bat, after some time, the system alone is in a mixed state. So this evolution takes you from pure state to mixed state. Uh, and for example, it can be described if the bat is Markovian by a Lindlad evolution or some Krauss map or quantum channel. Uh, on the other hand, what we're talking about in a monitored system is at some point in time, the system evolves maybe, and then at some point in time, an observer observes part of it or and looks at part of the degrees of freedom, and therefore projects the state into a, a new pure state that depends on the measurement of that. So in this case, if I look at the single trajectory of single world, right? A single world trajectory, the system is in a pure state from every point in the trajectory. If it starts in a pure state, continues in a pure state. So it's very different from a monitor system. Now, of course, you can say, but if I repeat the experiment, I'll have different measurement outcomes. If I average somehow over that indirectly, um, then it's, it's like discarding the measurement outcomes. And in this case, the kinds of average quantities I'll see are not different than a system coupling coupled to a bat. That will be correct, right? If I don't use somehow the information I gained from measuring the system, then there is no difference between these two. Uh, scenarios, but I'll be interested in the case where you somehow use these measurements, measurement outcomes. Uh, I, I wanted to actually, this is a nice demonstration of how, you know, what happens in one world line, every time you measure, you have uh, in random, you get either measurement outcome, say plus one or minus one, and you thereby generate a tree, and the wave function you end with, which I call, say, quantum trajectory, is, is basically specified by the global string of measurement outcomes. Okay, so uh, every time you do the experiment, generally you find yourself in a different branch. And this is the source of the problem that we're interested in when we talk about the impact of the experiment of the measurement, we're asking about the impact on that single branch wave function. In order to diagnose this impact, I need this single branch to occur more than once, so I can diagnose it with some correlation function that measuring an expectation value, but the probability that it will occur more than once dies off exponentially with the number of measurements I make. And if I'm interested in, say, thermodynamic limit, a large number of measurements, this is, of course, a hopeless endeavor. And that's the main problem of why it's hard to see the effect of impacts of measurement, many measurements. Um, I'll show kind of two solutions to that as I go along. But first, let's look at the, um, uh, ignore that problem and ask about the uh, interesting effects of the measurements, <laughs> supposing we could measure. In principle, we could measure them if we were sufficiently patient to do the experiment at the end of that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, are you assuming that you're going to make a measurement at the shortest distance here? Make a measurement of a cluster. Um, here, just as um, you know, usually I just for simplicity, I assume that I make a measurement that's completely local. Yeah, yeah, one two bit. But it's yeah. not really important. Eventually, when we talk about the course rate, um, yeah. Um, okay. 
Okay, so so here is the simplest model that people use. The first model that people use, and you know, one of the first people that actually um, looked into this in, uh, in serious video is Yao Gongli, who's here. I guess he's a postdoc here. Yeah, he's here. So uh, yeah, second in a minute. Um, uh, but the, the basic model is quantum hybrid quantum circuit where the uh, qubits are um, evolved using unitaries and uh, local measurements. So, you know, here is time, time goes on from the bottom to top. We start from some, let's say, pure quantum state, start to do measurements. Uh, these are the quantum unitaries. Uh, measurements evolve system in this um, projection in a way with probabilities that are determined by born, basically born rules. Which are the excitation value in, in the state. Um, oops. So, in this way, of course, you generate this tree of um, states, and we're interested in what happens in individual uh, branches here. One possible, you know, interesting uh, um, quantity to understand is how uh, the entanglement entropy of a this kind of pure state in a branch uh, behaves as a function of time. So if we had no measurement, then uh, the subsystem entanglement entropy will just grow because of the unitary entanglement dynamics. It will grow linearly in time and it, uh, until it saturates to the maximal value it can take, which is volume law state and maximal volume of about low two uh, per spin entropy. Um, and uh, and the question is, if I, and, and now to just simplification, I, I don't want to specify a particular branch, but I can average over the different branches and take the entanglement entropy. And that's important, of course, not of an average state, but of the pure state in a particular branch. Uh, if I do this averaging, then I, 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 the question is, what will happen uh, if I start to do measurements? And, Intuition is that if I do these measurements, the met I do measurements everywhere, and the measurements simply because they're local, they simply disentangle the bits you're measuring. If you measure enough, maybe you will completely disentangle the state. And uh, what Yaldong and uh, Chen and Fisher found in, uh, in parallel at the same time, um, Skinner and all, um, they found that this happens as a phase transition. So the, the volume of entanglement entropy is not immediately destroyed according to the numerics um, at um, you know, infinitesimal amount of measurement. You need, when you, your measurement probability exceeds some um, uh, threshold, only then the entanglement entropy of, of the state uh, drops down to be an area law instead of volume of, at, at long time. Okay, so, so this is basically the result, and here are plots, and you can do finite size scaling analysis and see that it, this has happened. This happens, they did really nice numerics using Clifford circuits, or you can do very large numerics and see that at least in, uh, for Clifford gates, this is a very well uh, established um, phase transition. Uh, the nice thing is that there is also a very, um, there is a, uh, Neat theoretical way to understand this phase transition. It's a new kind of phase transition, phase transition in quantum dynamics from an area law state to volume law state it has nothing to do with thermodynamics. So, how do you start? Where is um, the framework to even start to address it? There turns out to be a really nice statistical mechanics mapping to a classical statistical mechanics model that allows to treat this transition. I won't go very deeply into it because it's not important for the rest of my talk, but the idea is that there is um, the dynamics can be thought of as some tensor network that uh, when you calculate some quantity uh, like the entanglement entropy, you have to contract this tensor network. This contraction is generally very hard to do, but if you average that quantity over uh, Many, many realizations of the circuit, and here the fact that the circuit is random uh, is very helpful. If you average over all the possible realizations of, of the circuit um, properly, you see that this uh, contraction of the tensor network becomes very simplified and it becomes identical to summing over configurations of 
effective classical spins. These classical spins, of course, have nothing to do with the uh, original spins in the system. They basically, is, these degrees of freedom correspond to some um, pairing of Feynman paths of the many body quantum state as it goes through the different unit areas, right? So these different unit areas have forward and backward uh, evolution of quantum paths, and there is a question whether you pair these quantum paths between, um, they're, they're actually one forward, one backward, and again, another forward and another backward uh, evolution because we're calculating something like the density matrix squared. Each one of them is evolving uh, is, is evolving by uh, some Heisenberg-like evolution with unitary on the left and unitary on the right. So overall, you have something like four unitaries. And uh, there's the, the, it turns out that the important degrees of freedom are is pairing of, of these Feynman paths of forward and backward time evolutions. And, and these can be represented as classical spins and averaging over or Summing over all these possible configurations of pairing of Feynman paths of, in the dynamics is uh, effectively like summing the partition function of spins and calculating the event and entanglement entropy between region A and region B is like forcing a domain wall through region A and calculating the domain wall free energy. And in this mapping, uh, you know, volume loss state. Is the state where the domain wall energy is of the order of the size of the domain wall, which is the ordered state of the spins. But in the paramagnetic state of the spins, domain walls are, of course, cheap. cheap. If, I, you know, if I force the domain wall in the boundary, it won't cost me anything except for order one, right? So that's basically the difference between these two phases. So the nice thing, basically, the main takeaway is that although this is a very complicated dynamical situation, you can um, map the in some important quantities that you want to that you might want to compute, like the entanglement entropy between uh, subsystems, into uh, an effective statistical mechanics model uh, that represents where the different uh, Boltzmann weights represent actually um, different pairings of Feynman paths of the dynamics. Um, okay, then I'm not going to go over this. The nice thing is that this is not just kind of neat, it's also very useful to predict a host of other phenomena that I'm not going to go into. But for example, one can show that if the circuits have more structure, you can have not just a volume on area law phase, but you can have many more. Uh, substructure and, and more phases, you can ask what kind of phases you can have uh, if in uh, rather than time evolution of, of qubits, you have a uh, time evolution of fermions. Uh, and, um, and, and you can ask what happens if you add some uh, decoherence, a little bit of decoherence to all this story, and so on. And, and these uh, uh, effective statistical mechanics model give you kind of well-known tools to deal with all of these situations. Um, but what actually will be important for uh, uh, part two of my talk is to understand this phase transition also in terms of encoding of information. So this quantum circuit can also be kind of symbolically um, drawn in this way, where this is uh, the circuit is a big unitary. Uh, this is the input of the unitary. This is the output. Um, and there is some someone putting a wave function that we don't know, let's say Alice, and trying to transmit this wave function, which carries some quantum information through this uh, through this circuit, and then it's read by Bob. And you can ask the question whether Bob can reconstruct Alice's wave function from the output. Of course, if there was if it was a fully unitary evolution. You know, generally, of course, you can. Nothing goes uh, away. But let's say there is an eavesdropper that measures some of the qubits along the way. You can ask whether, in that case, Bob can still reconstruct Alice with some identity. And it turns out that this phase transition is exactly a phase transition in so-called quantum channel capacity, in the ability, theoretical ability, 
of God to reconstruct addicts. And that fidelity of being able to reconstruct addicts goes to zero if, if the eavesdropper measures too much uh, and destroy and this way destroys quantum channels. And there is an interesting flip side. You can also look at this transition information theoretically from the side of the eavesdropper E. You can ask how much information is the eavesdropper um, uh, accumulating about the initial state by, by looking at it only locally. And by the way, maybe before saying that, I forgot to say what this also gives a nice explanation. Um, this information theoretic way of viewing it, and it gives a nice explanation of why the system is, is robust to um, a dilute set of measurements. If I measure to the, in two dilute way, what is going on is that the circuit is scrambling the information that Alice had in the wave function. If the information was initially local, it's now scrambled by the unitary evolution. And then just looking at it locally cannot reveal the, the information. The information is basically hidden and the system behaves as a quantum error correction code because uh, it, that protects the quantum information. So it's protected by the scrambling. Mm -hmm. right? Can I ask a naive question? Yeah. Horizontal axis space and vertical time? Yes. Is that the box? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, box, right. And so, so there is an emergent quantum error correction code that no matter how long you propagate the system, as long as it's sufficiently wide, right, uh, you, you will retain the information and no matter how many times you measure, as long as your measurements are sufficiently low, low frequency, uh, measures at sufficiently low rate. Um, now, uh, I, I said that this is because if, when it measures locally, it does not reveal the information that Alex had. So there should be a flip side uh, of this phase transition in the information, and this is called Fisher information and in information theoretic language. What is the um, uh, what, what is the information that you can gather about the initial state? Let's say I make the smallest change in my initial state, whether Eve, if it looks, if Eve repeats the experiments and constructs a probability distribution, whether that probability distribution will be sensitive to changes in the initial state. It turns out that um, it's sensitive to the initial state, but to a very small amount. And if you go be above uh, critical, Threshold and only when you go above the critical threshold, he becomes maximally sensitive to the initial state and can recognize that the initial state has um, changed with maximum fidelity. Basically, just as if she would measure uh, every qubit immediately at the beginning. Um, okay, so so now this actually so this brings me directly to my next section that now one can ask. It's, I mean, it's so natural to ask that I don't know how I didn't think about it before. Uh, okay, let, let me let me just say the question before. But yeah, the, the question is: Let's say instead of measuring, eaves, just eavesdrop basically takes steals qubits out of uh, the unitary, but doesn't measure. So what Eve now will hold in her hands is just a big quantum wave function. She's not measuring it yet. Now, suppose she puts it into a decoder. Can Eve reconstruct Alice by uh, putting her state into a decoder? Yes. Yeah, so for example, Eve applies some unitary that could be just a swap, right? So whatever qubit existed in the place where Eve wants to stay, she swaps it with a qubit, qubit she holds in her hand. And, and then, yeah, that qubit she holds in her hand can either be known to her or not. That will, not, will matter somewhat, but not to everything I'm going to say. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to just define what it means here, but in the end, she ends up with, she sees the qubits just as they were, but now they're with her and not with Bob. And the question is whether she steals it with some probability. At some, some point, at what point can she reconstruct Alice from her qubits? Even if she doesn't measure at all, she never measures classically, she just wants to put her, she, but she owns a quantum computer, she can program it any way she wants, 
And now she she wants to um, reconstruct addicts with this quantum computer. And it turns out, as we'll see, that there is also a phase transition. It's different than the measurement in this transition, but it, in some sense, there is a similarity. It's a, it's a phase transition in the uh, encoding, you know, possibility of encoding. Uh, okay, so uh, this is actually work that was uh, put on the web. Uh, Seth Feinstein, who was the main uh, person on this uh, work, and, and also Shane Kelly, who was a visiting student uh, uh, with uh, Jamil and Marion. Um, okay, so the best way to understand this is actually think about it as a scrambling transition. So let me take a step back and understand if I have just a unitary circuit, I don't have any new speeding anything, just a unitary circuit, and I try to evolve uh, an operator in this unitary circuit. So there is, you have to think of this now as double, there is an operator and there is a unitary acting from both sides of it. Uh, and uh, now, if, if the operator is, say, a Pauli operator, of course, it won't stay a Pauli operator. It won't stay a Pauli X. It will start to grow and become more and more complex. It's easiest to envision if this is a Clifford circuit, then it becomes larger, but it doesn't become a superposition of many Pauli strings. It becomes X turns into XXZ, XXZ turns into XZZY and so on into larger and larger strings and it grows like a big tree like this. And, and this tree can be, be diagnosed by the out of time order correlation. So out of time order correlation is let's say this is my operator. Now I take another operator at some point, let's say the Y operator at some point R and look at the uh, commutation relation. If there is some um, span of the Pauli string that reaches this point Y, then there would be a non trivial commutator usually, and I can get something non zero on average. Okay, and um, so, so by this, um, by this out of time order correlator, so called, you can diagnose whether your operator has reached a certain point and what is the depth probability that it has reached it. And if you sum over this total over the entire space, you sort of measure, you get a measure of the operator size, which you expect to grow with a, some kind of light mode. This is kind of a well-known, and people have been interested in, it's, it's called quantum scrambling. It's how operators that are initially simple become larger and more complex. And, and this uh, OTOC measures it. But now let's look at, uh, so, so wait, uh, this is numerics, just so, showing one run, it's not an expectation value here, actually, it's just one run of this, and uh, looking at the um, uh, commutator uh, in the case of a Clifford circuit, you see this tree growing. But now let's change the uh, circuit a bit. And in addition to this, these random two-side two unitary gates add, um, at some random position, we, in, we create, we have a swap gate acting between your circuit qubits to some external and some external qubits. So there are many external qubits, and these external qubits are swapped into your system, and there is a qubit from the system swapped out. This is your Eve qubit. Right? So Eve is now speed, starting to speed qubits out of your system. And you can ask, in this case, start with some Pauli operator and let it evolve. And ask, how does the out of time order correlation evolve with, with some operator still in the circuit, right? Not in Eve's case. Yes? What's the initial state of the E qubits? Yeah, for now, it doesn't matter. For this, actually, it doesn't matter at all. For, for, uh, later on, we'll see, for, for something more sudden that maybe I won't get to, it, it is. But you could do simple states. You can say either maximum mix, which is like saying he has no idea what is the uh, initial state of the, these qubits. In which case, there will always be a phase transition in some, some, some time. Um, but for, for this, uh, or another case, is these are all initialized in say some zero state. So we can have both of them. For, for this scrambling transition that I show now, it doesn't matter. Um, so, so here is how the tree develops, but now you see what is going on here. Every time E is a qubit, if you think about it in the uh, uh, 
how the Pali Surya goes, it chops off the branch of the tree because an operator can mark the bottom of that branch. So it looks like kind of a percolating tree where you chop more and more branches until it can't percolate. And that part, that's a phase transition. And you can actually uh, exactly uh, map it to a, a stochastic process of this form um, that's called directed percolation. Uh, here is the rest of the population transition. It's, it's ubiquitous in many population dynamics models. For example, if you have bacteria at the bottom and can either you know, split, they can move left or right, they can spontaneously die, or they can coalesce. If two bacteria go to the same point, then usually they fight and only one remains. Uh, and so, so these are the uh, processes in the future of your economy. Can ask whether the colony continues to grow and eventually go to maybe saturate to some, if there is some finite size, it will saturate to some finite population, uh, population density. And there is a state where it actually dies off completely called an absorbing state where there are no bacteria. Because one, it's important, one um, process that cannot occur in real life is a bacteria just you know, created out of nothing. There is at least. You know, if nature is not religious, it can happen, and also our, you know, it, it can happen in our out of bank order correlation. If you have no operator, it cannot just come out of the order. Um, and and that's exactly so. So the uh, dynamics of the out of bank order correlation is basically like this bacteria population growth, and you can we can see it very well in in this kind of Clifford evolution. There is a, a, a robust Phase transition that follows exactly non -critical, critical non trivial critical exponents that occur in this directed percolation transition. Okay, so, so I told you that this is also an information transition, and in fact, you can show indeed that it is. So you take Eve, Eve uh, this is Eve, and if Eve now sticks in her qubit into a decoder, you can ask whether she can reconstruct uh, uh, the initial state that Alice puts in. And it turns out that the, there is a very, very simple decoder that does that if the tree is, is non percolating. If basically, if the tree is non percolating, you can imagine all the information uh, from Alice basically spills out to Eve and she can reconstruct it in a simple decoder. And that simple decoder is simply taking the um, time evolution backward. Because this is a unitary circuit, including the swaps, you take all of this backward. Just stick it in, and um, you know there it and and uh, Eve basically, uh, sorry, Alice then pops out out of the S two, so or S one, way out, and uh, and and that it doesn't matter in this case what you stick in. So whatever it, it, Eve Eve needs to stick in an initial state here, which if you, you know were naive, you'd say, well, this initial state must be exactly the Output state here for this to exactly infer, but it doesn't have to be. It can be anything, including just the maximum next. And you still, it still works. Uh, and it works uh, in the percolating phase. That's, so this fidelity in the percolating phase is exactly one. So low of the fidelity is zero, while below the percolating uh, trans percolation transition, you see that it goes below one. Um, Okay, so this is different from the case we were discussing the phase transition. How much you know, can you reconstruct the black hole? Is it actually putting these to the back into the system? Um, I'm sorry, the phase transition, you mean like a half hidden Prescott type? Uh, yeah, or you're or asking a similar question, right? If you're yeah, yeah. the radiation and at what point can you reconstruct yeah. these things? Yeah, yeah, so that, that's very, very good point. So it's Somewhat reminiscent of Hyden Prescott, except they don't have a transition. There is just a crossover yes. where here yes. there is a transition. There is also a big difference because in the Hyden Prescott and all of these protocols, you start out with all of the uh, completely entangled with the black hole. So uh, what they have in mind is that uh, he collected from the beginning of the black hole to now uh, all the hopping radiation that has it. And only after that, Alice throws her, and you're utilizing the entanglement you have already with the black hole. Here, Eve starts out non-entangled with the black hole, and 
everything happens dynamically as you go along. And actually, this turned out to be kind of in that some sense a more interesting scenario, maybe more realistic if you can call this black hole games realistic at all. Uh, well, it's certainly realistic in a quantum circuit, um, but, uh, but, but in, in fact, that's why I think it's maybe a better model for an evaporating black hole where your observer is not, it doesn't uh, hold with, you know, the primordial radiation of the black hole for eternity and then, uh, but really everything is happening dynamically. And in that case, it turns out to be, there is a phase transition depending on the rate at which the black hole emits. Yeah, so it's closely related, but it's not, it, it would be very interesting to see more relation. So for example, one can ask the question, can you now play Hayden Presky games, but instead of using the original radiation, using that radiation that you picked up dynamically along the way? And, and that would be an interesting question to ask, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, the main upshot is that there is an information transition like that, but and it's of course in a. Uh, I'm not going to say that you know you can do this experiment tomorrow with a large number of bits. However, at least philosophically, in principle, this is possible if you have a quantum computer. On the other hand, the measurement in those transition as it is is not possible. Is it exponentially hard even for a, a quantum computer? Because even if you have a quantum computer, you need to repeat the um, the protocol is exponentially large number of times before you can uh, co-select the correct state. So at least this is easy with a quantum computer, while the first one is hard also for a quantum computer. Yes. So, um, what are you claiming for the universal being the transition? Is it like directed? It's classical directed directed perturbation. Classical directed perturbation. So there's a certain set of exponents you could use to characterize. Yeah. So that's what we did. Yeah, we characterized it completely with an exponent. There is, a, there is an interesting parallel with the measurement in those conditions where in some simple limit, so one can show directed perturbation and actually map to a model of directed perturbation using diff um, or using uh, hard random unitaries with uh, large qubit dimension. In both of these cases, we can map exactly to directed perturbation. And there is a parallel in large qubit dimension. Also, the measurement in this transition can be mapped to a perturbation transition. Exactly. But then, when you compute the 1 over d correction, like the 1 over d, 1 over qubit dimension, turns out that these corrections are relevant and it's close to some other state transition that you don't know. So, this mapping is only in some asymptotic. Okay. Um, the, the mapping is you can also do the mapping away from large d. But then it's more complicated, and the terms you get turn out to be relevant in the perturbation transition in the usual measurement in this transition. In this transition, where there is directed perturbation, directed perturbation is more robust than perturbation. Yes. And the one over d corrections are irrelevant as far as we can tell. There is some, it turns out that there, there are some subtleties in, in case of Clifford's, there is a transition, and the transition means that. At a finite time, you get exactly zero um, three completely cuts off. So it's like very classical perturbation. In the case of um, random hard unitaries, the tree doesn't cut off at a finite time. In different, you have a distribution of times depending on uh, the realization of your. Um, so in different realizations, the tree will cut off at different times. And there, it, there is a you know, uh, infinite pain of where it happened. So it's not exactly like directly classical directed perturbation, but it's the same universality that's uh, in, in, in non different circuits. Yeah. Um, so, so if you look at um, something beyond the average, you will find maybe more interesting transitions in, in um, random hard materials. Um, and well, in Clifford's, we found just direct perturbation always. Um, okay, now, how much time do I have? Do I just... Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay, so I, I, okay, so so in the finale, I want to talk about something kind of related but different, and kind of ask how measurement. Now when you're back to measurement, but instead of a very complicated, complex state in. A, uh, quantum circuit, I want to ask the impact of measurements on much more familiar states, ground states of quantum systems. Um, 
uh, yeah, so so basically you should think of it, this is the ground state, now I partially measure it, I measure locally in some random points, and I ask, after I measure the ground state, I have like part of the degree of freedom are still there and it's entangled, and I can ask about how correlations in the ground state have been changed from that, how correlations in the measured state um, are modified compared to the ground state correlation. And whether the asymptotic long distance correlations are even there, <laughs> although the measurements are completely over. And I want to show that in principle, yes, the, even the very longest range correlations can change if the system is in an, initially in a long range entangled state. Um, and as an example, it's, it's more general. We can look at, at you know, non system, critical systems in more than one dimension. But the simplest way to exemplify this transition is a one dimension and quantum liquid. Uh, so you, this is the state, for example, if you have bosons in the one dimension and uh, potential, for example, the kinds that uh, Ben Lev uh, uh, creates here. Um, and, and you now measure weakly uh, the particle density uh, and in a way that actually with their cavities, I think in principle is possible to measure. So suppose you, have, you measure it in some finite resolution <laughs> way and, and um, the measurement of uh, photons with which you measure are weakly coupled to the atoms. Um, but now you measure it once, and then right after you measure, you don't let the gas evolve in time or anything, you now evaluate some correlation function in your gas. How to do it is, well, that would be the uh, finale of the finale, because I, I claim that there is a way to do it which overcomes uh, the post selection problem, at least for this problem. So just as a reminder of one dimension of quantum liquids, there is a universal description of the long wavelength, long distance behavior of one dimension of quantum liquids, whether they're bosons or fermions, they are all described by so-called Lessinger liquid. Uh, think of bosons now, simple, uh, one way to describe this one dimension of quantum liquid is to think about phase of a superfluid. The phase of a superfluid has quantum fluctuation in the uh, because of interactions, uh, and uh, and this, these quantum fluctuations can be thought of as kind of quadratic, as quadratic, and um, yeah. So so the fixed point uh, of a one dimension of quantum liquid is basically quadratic fluctuations of this phase, and k, which is sometimes called the stiffness or the Lagrange parameter, basically controls. We'll control and we'll see how long how how phase correlations decay in, in space and time. Um, there is an alternative description where you can think of the atoms as uh, at almost well-defined positions, and it just deviates a little bit from their equilibrium positions. This is like, you know, a lattice solid, but a solid, a harmonic solid with small fluctuations, and, and, and uh, the deviations from the solid uh, equilibrium positions of the crystal is described by, by this uh, field phi. It, you know, it's a discrete field, but if you talk about long wavelength, you can think about it as, um, as a continuous field. And it also has uh, corresponds to harmonic, uh, harmonic uh, fluctuation. And uh, it this, this, uh, it characterized by exactly the same parameter k, except now we find one over k in the action, except for k. So these are dual descriptions. Each other phi is a dual to the phase phi. Uh, so to phase theta phi, the position is dual to the phase. And that's related to the um, canonical conjugacy relation between the uh, position and momentum. Um, so in this long wavelength description, for example, the density of the atoms, the local density of the atoms is uh, more or less the gradient of the field phi. Plus, if you want to take into account, and it's important sometimes to take into account the fact that the atoms are discrete and there is some, uh, uh, the density also has a deep modulations uh, at the wavelength associated with the interparticle distance, then there is this cosine of um, two times two pi rows x times two pi. Uh, so, so this is 
basically the dictionary that tells you what is the density in this uh, long wavelength degrees of freedom. And the Lattinger parameter k equals one corresponds to non interacting fermions or hardcore bosons, k less than one are repulsive fermions or bosons with long range, for example, dipolar interactions would be uh, k less than one. And, and these have already been uh, realized in various labs. For example, this is an example from, uh, from Manuel Bloch's uh, group where you see the power law. Uh, correlations. I, I, I can say that this is the nice thing about these critical states. They allow you to continuously tune the critical exponents. So, for example, if you look at the density density correlations in this ground state, they decay with. So, there is one part that decays, uh, smooth part of the density density correlations decay with the universal power of 1 over x squared, but there are also modulations at the inner particle wavelength. Uh, and these modulations decay. Uh, at um, with one over x to some unit power that is completely set by this Lattinger parameter. So if you tune the interactions, you can continuously tune the exponent by which the power of correlations decay. So it's a really nice example of a critical state to continuously tune its exponent. And it also has power law decay of the phase correlations, which are dual to to these density correlations, and they decay basically with a power law that's you know, set by one over k instead of two. That's a duality between them. Um, okay, so now we do a quantum non demolition measurement where we measure the density dt everywhere. Uh, so, just as a warm up, I want to do it in the simplest possible way where I measure. I'm going to do the measurement in the following way, which is actually a realistic measurement. Um, the, if it, the photons interact weakly with the system, if they don't interact with the system, if, if they happen not to interact with any atom, then they basically stay in their state zero. If they interact and they have some unitary transformation that and gives you a superposition of zero and another state one. The state one could be, for example, a different polarization state of the photon. Um, and um, so when you get zero, I, I call it no big, it means that either there was no particle there, or because the rotation was so small, you, you basically still, you were still in the found in the zero state. There is very high probability of that. So, Particle of, of rotation after a zero state of heat state remains indefinite, just maybe slightly biases you towards knowing that there is no particle there, but only slightly. On the other hand, when you find one, it means that there is a particle in this location for sure. Okay. Uh, now, the most likely state per photon is, of course, zero because the photon hardly interacts with the atoms. So let's look at, let's post it at, on the most likely state, which is this state is all zeros. This is still an non-trivial state because by fa the fact that you've got all zeros means that you um, you bias your state into more likely not having particles at the locations where you measure. And let me measure at some locations which are somehow commensurate with the inter interparticle distance. If I do that, and okay, and, and the question is, if after I do that, how does it impact the correlations that we saw? Right? So whether the correlations will remain what they were before. Um, yeah. So so um, there is a because I'm post-selecting on a very very specific state. It turns out that the dynamics that the measurement impose on the system are very simple. They're basically like imaginary time evolution with some. Uh, you know, with, with this function v is the strength of the measurement as a function of x, and if I set up v correctly in the right way, then in the long wavelength description, it just behaves as imaginary time evolution for some short time on my uh, ground state. Okay, that's the nice thing about this. This is in this uh, kind of warm up problem. But now I, I want to show you that this warm up problem is very nice. I can describe that post measurement correlations by first by taking some any very trivial reference state, time evolving it, imaginary time evolving it with the actual critical Hamiltonian. That would bring me a minute, okay, to the critical state, then evolve it with this uh, in short time imaginary time evolution, okay, and then sandwich these correlations. 
And that is like sandwiching my correlations with some effective theoretic action and that corresponds to you know uh, this imaginary band evolution. And and this action is very easy to write down, right? It just in, in includes this um, imaginary kind of evolution with this term everywhere. And also imaginary kind of evolution to infinite time uh, um, with, with this. So this is this is how it goes. So I it evolved with imaginary infinite imaginary time up to this point now and a little bit. And then the same thing from the left, but I sandwich it. This the, this looks exactly the same as a well-known problem in um, uh, by, by Latinger liquid, which is a, a transport to a single impurity in a Latinger liquid, uh, where the impurity is in every point in time, but nowhere in space. If you can rotate from time to space, and this is completely rotationally invariant from time to space, you get exactly the same problem, and you can do the translation and find something really nice. And now I'll, I'll just go through it and just, just give you the, the upshot is that the measurements can be thought of as a perturbation that you can test with uh, scaling theory, whether this perturbation is relevant or not. If it's irrelevant, then at sufficiently long distances, you still have exactly the same correlations as you had in the ground state. The measurements don't change anything. No matter how strong the correlation the measurements were, as long as you have some unmeasured uh, re re uh, measured, unmeasured atoms, the long distance correlations are completely un unchanged, the universe of parts. On the other hand, if you're in the uh, re regime where the measurements are relevant, and that depends on k, k less than one, then you will have completely changed the correlations, even at long distances, and trying to calculate how exactly you change them, and basically make the correlations much more short range, but still power on correlation compared to. Uh, so, so that's really nice. That's only the toy problem, the, which is also in principle you can do, but the more oh, somehow. I, okay, so here I have to jump, and if you want, you can ask me later. Um, the more interesting thing is to average over an ensemble of measurement outcomes. Um, and then there is one in order to apply these averaging, one, to have, one has to set up a replica scheme and think the replica limit. It turns out to be more complicated. Uh, and you see, you find that there is a phase transition in a different value of the Lattinger parameter where the measurements become relevant. Uh, but there is still a phase transition. The nice thing is that. And, and that's the last thing I want to say is that this transition turns out to be observable um, in, in, in some kind of clever way that uh, Sam uh, Garrett uh, quotes that. Um, the, the point is that in order to see it in principle, you need to look at an observable like this. You need to look at the correlation, for example, phase correlation between point R and zero, um, but uh, sum over different measurement outcomes times probability of measurement outcomes times the correlation function squares. Otherwise, you won't see anything. Otherwise, it's like discarding measurement outcomes. Um, this is something that's hard to see. So we want to change it to an alternative quantity where you measure, you average something that's linear in the density matrix. Averaging something like that is like averaging, usual averaging uh, that basically you find errors going down as one over the number of measurements, square, square root of the number of measurements. So yeah, where WM is some weighing function uh, that we want to design. If we design it correctly, we should be able to see exactly the same measurement. If, if WM was one, we'll see nothing, it's like discarding measurement outcomes. If we'll use measurement outcomes in order to calculate some WM, we'll get some something about the measurement, uh, uh, something about this transition turns out that if you can calculate the conditional correlation function given a set of measurements the experiment gives you, then you can stick that in, in instead of WM and um, and 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 um, evaluate this kind of what you call we call classical quantum correlator. Uh, that will have exactly the same behavior as this object that is invisible. 
Okay, so um, that's it. I, I uh, give you some background on the measurement in this transition. I showed you a, trend, uh, a scrambling transition that is equivalent to a decoding transition without measurement, and also kind of a taste of a measurement induced transition in quantum ground states that turns out to be observable with some app by using a hybrid of quantum and app, quantum observation and observation of quantum states and um, classical computation. So you you did make a comment about uh, for the directed percolation, like the uh, that, that applies to both the Haar and Clifford yeah. cases. So in the Clifford case, it kind of like, visually makes sense. You have like one, you don't have a superposition of operators. You just have like one operator string, right. and then you're like right. filling right. spots right. in it. Right. Right. Um, in the Haar case, if you have a superposition of these operator strings, yes. or uh, strings, right. like. How, how do you visualize what happens uh, um, when you when you replace qubits? Like, are you setting? Okay. So first of all, if you look at the hard, the average of our, the, the sorry, the expectation value over the initial density matrix, right? Uh, then Clifford and Har should be the same by expectation value because uh -huh. uh, they're both um, uh, to, they, yeah. up to three design, and this is a two design quantum, so they right. behave the same. But the way I, I, you should think about it is in a particular evolution, the Clifford circuit is completely deterministic. So um, you will get uh, in, in this big, uh, there is no superposition of state, and you have just one deterministic evolution. And for each circuit design, you'll get a point where it's uh, the tree is completely gone. Mm -hmm. But in the hard random case, it won't be like that because there are many branches uh, of the wave function, and each branches of the wave function builds kind of a tree, right? And uh, so, so there is not one time where all the branches are cut off. It, yeah. It's just that there is below the percolation transition, there is an exponential decay, and above the percolation transition, there is no exponential decay of, of the density. Mm -hmm. So, so if you basically right, so that's it. That's how I, I kind of see it. Um, yeah. Yes, for the uh, quantity at the very end, this hybrid quantum classical uh, correlator. Um, sorry if you said it and I missed it, but what is the computational complexity of computing this conditional? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. So. In, at least for that either liquids, it's very low. Or at least for, I would say, one-dimensional systems, you can always do it by DMRG. Even critical states. Yeah. Uh, okay. In critical states, yeah, it's okay. So it's for the state point, you don't get complexity. Like you have in, in a DMRG calculation. In two dimensions, you can also do it easily only in systems that don't have a sign problem. So if you don't have a sign problem, you can... Uh, also uh, do it in two dimensional systems. The really big question is whether you can do it in systems which you cannot calculate classically without a sign problem. So suppose you could do some kind of variation on Monte Carlo and yeah, with a very expressive wave function and sort of optimize the wave function also with a quantum computer, maybe you can do it like that, for example, and, and then use that as a quantum classical estimator. If you have a quantum computer, maybe you can do it even without uh, by, by using kind of very expressive wave But that that is the very you know, open question. Great. Thank you.